Hey guys, Josh for Deptic Channel, and over the last almost 20 years of being a diesel mechanic, I've heard lots of stories. Stories of engines that run on pure water. Engines that were jet-powered cars. Engines that run on Brown's gas. Engines that maybe they could make a steam engine that uses the exhaust or cooling to regenerate and power the transmission somehow. All sorts of weird stuff. And over the last week, I've actually been delving into a lot of these ideas and trying to dig up, was there any truth to any of these claims? What, what the heck are most of these stories, kind of these urban legends we've heard over most of our careers probably? We've kind of an infatuation with the idea of this reclusive savant that probably isn't married, doesn't have kids, and he lives in a garage and he just works on this ingenious engine design or something, and maybe the government or big oil's out to get him, and, they destroy him or destroy his plans and there's a lot of those type of conspiracies out there so probably the biggest one that i've ever heard of and first one i started doing research on was the water car what the heck's the water car well at least what most people seem to relate it to me was this guy this genius came up with this idea that you basically it just runs on water and of course water is basically free and the government killed him or big oil killed him and he had this ingenious idea so what the heck are they talking about? Well, the story, at least the most common one that I can find, is actually a true story. At least the story is true. The specifics about it, up for a lot of debate, I would say. But the man's name was Stanley Meyer, and he did build what he claimed was a vehicle that ran on water. Now, that doesn't mean he was injecting water into an internal combustion engine. Not really how it worked. It was a hydrogen-powered car. At least that was his claim. So he supposedly invented this car and patented this design that would produce hydrogen on board to power this engine to power the car. Very interesting inventions. And folks, to help pay for this video, speaking of interesting inventions, we've got a little ad and then we'll get back to the actual meat of the subject. So the folks over at Viva said, hey, do you want to try one of these ladders? It's an expandable ladder, only weighs about 35 pounds. And I've never seen one like this. And I said, well, let me check the specifications out. And sure as heck, 400 pound rated folks, fully ANSI certified, it's 100% safe. I was like, well, why don't you send one over and I'll check it out for you. Hey folks, so we're out in, well, the wilds in the corner of my property here. And we got this ladder here from Viver and it's an 18 and a half foot ladder. And as you can see, it really collapses down. It's pretty light. It's only about 30, 35 pounds, I'd say. They have them in two different sizes. This is the larger one. It's uh, pretty interesting. So one thing to note, these are removable, the hooks. It's got these, which are meant to, I guess, go to a tree or something rounded would be fine. And one thing to note on this guy is something I didn't understand until I used it a little bit, is the locking feature. So as you can see, these tabs are in the unlock position. This one's in the lock position all the way over to the right. So when you go to use it, and remember folks, I didn't invent this thing, but if you move it up, it's gonna half lock. It's not fully over and it's not fully unlocked. You'd think you'd step on it, but it's not fully in yet until you move the next one up. Now, if you watch these, you can see it move over more. Now, now they're fully locked. This one doesn't lock until the next set is up, if that makes sense. And then you can keep moving it up. So folks, I wanted to try this ladder out in action here, and I've been meaning to change this light bulb for the last few months. It's in a weird spot on my property, and the other ladder I have is kind of a pain in the butt, so this one's so much lighter and easier to use. I wanted to make sure it worked fine. Going up and down, and it felt totally safe. I'd be happy to use it again. If you guys want to check one out, check out the link in the descriptions, and thanks to Viver for this ad. Now, it was basically a dune buggy, and he had he actually had patents on it for this design that it was a way to make hydrogen, which is a real combustible fuel. It's not, obviously, water's not combustible, but if you can separate the oxygen from the hydrogen, hydrogen is a valid fuel. There's a lot of problems with using hydrogen. It's not as energy dense. Uh, you usually have to store it under very high pressure. It's hard to be contained because the molecules are very, very small. They can actually get through certain type of metals and containers, unlike most liquids or high pressure gases. And his claim was that on board, you could use water, break it into hydrogen, and then it would 
go through, I believe it was using this type of internal combustion engine for the hydrogen, and then that would power the vehicle. Could you make a vehicle that runs on hydrogen? Well, yes, there are hydrogen powered vehicles. I've actually been in one in Las Vegas. This must have been close to 20 years ago. They had an alternative fuels vehicle convention at the college I was going to at the time, and they had a hydrogen powered vehicle. I believe it was a Honda, if I remember correctly, but it was a million dollar car, and it didn't feel like a million dollar car. It was basically a $15,000 car with a million dollars worth of research into it. But it worked fine. It was quiet. The, no emissions, at least out of the tailpipe. So what we're talking about is the invention of his hydrogen car. And one of the biggest claims was he drove this vehicle from Los Angeles to New York on 23 gallons of water. That's all he used was 23 gallons of water to power this vehicle. Now, a dune buggy is not very heavy, folks, so it's not 50,000 pounds. So it's not going to consume a ton of resources to move a vehicle of, let's say, 1,500 pounds from Los Angeles to New York, which is roughly about 3,000 miles. But let's just do a basic math calculation to see if it's even energy-wise even possible. So hydrogen, from the research I could do, and like hydrogen is about a 10 to 1 ratio from water to actually usable hydrogen. So if he had 23 gallons of water that he had to convert into usable hydrogen, he would only be getting about 2.3 gallons of usable hydrogen. Now, is hydrogen more or less energy dense than gasoline or diesel? Well, from what I can find, it's significantly less dense. So a comparable amount of diesel has about three times as many kilocalories per measure unit. So if you were running, uh, a gallon of diesel has about 35,000 kilocalories. A gallon of hydrogen will only have about 12,000 calories from what I could find. So so yes, hydrogen is a lot less volumetrically efficient when it comes to storage. So a, say a gallon of diesel to a gallon of hydrogen, diesel has a lot more energy for that volume. But by weight, hydrogen is actually inverse. So by weight, by kilogram or pound, hydrogen has a lot more energy than diesel, but it takes a lot more area to hold the weight. So we're measuring in gallons, at least that's how the story was. So that's how that statement works. You would have to basically have a vehicle that would move from Los Angeles to New York on less than a usable gallon of fuel? Just the premise of that does not make any sense. I mean, that'd be some really good fuel economy, folks. What would that be? Probably about 4,000 miles per gallon. Seems just from that that it's pretty much impossible, folks. If you just do the math, right? Now, maybe it did go from Los Angeles to New York, and it just had a 23 gallon tank and to fill it up a bunch of times. I'm just saying what the claims that I've seen were. The math does not anywhere nearly fill out. Now, if it was, I burned 2,300 gallons or 230 gallons or something like that, the math could work out in that way. But just 23 gallons of water, it, it's, it's not possible, folks. I mean, it's not mathematically possible to do that. So that gets to the other side, which is this would have been a perpetual motion machine. And so something able to produce energy out of nothing, basically. You might be saying, well, no, he's using water as a fuel and you have to add water, right? No, no, because water's not a fuel. Water's not combustible. Hydrogen is. So if he was adding just hydrogen, he could power his vehicle, but then you're constantly adding hydrogen. Water not being combustible, you have to break it into oxygen and hydrogen. Now that process is done. You can still do it today. That's how they make hydrogen fuel. So here's the problem with the fundamental design. How do you start breaking down the water to get the hydrogen? You need energy to do that. Well, where are you getting the energy from? Electricity? You have to produce the electricity somehow. Maybe had an onboard battery that was fully charged and it started the process. The problem is that battery has to then be charged somehow to make the hydrogen to power the vehicle. And that would probably have to be produced by an alternator. The alternator is pulling power out of the engine, which was used to power the engine. But now that's not to say you can't have a hydrogen powered vehicle. Like I said, you could do that, but it would always be a net negative. So you'd have to start off with a certain amount of hydrogen to power 
the process to make slightly more hydrogen would cost more in hydrogen than you would be getting out of it. Does that make sense? So the premise in and of itself, folks, it just doesn't work. Now you might be saying, well, big oil, maybe it did work and someone killed them off because they wanted to keep running fossil fuels. Well, there's lots of alternatives to fossil fuels out there, folks, that aren't just hydrogen based. Obviously, Elon Musk makes a lot of electric cars. They're not fossil fuel based. No one's killed him off. So the argument that it was a conspiracy to get rid of this guy because he was some sort of mad scientist genius. I've heard that a lot over the years on many things and I don't buy it, folks. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he did invent this. Maybe it did go from Los Angeles to New York. 23 gallons of water. Maybe he was killed by big oil or the government. Who knows? I'm just saying as a mechanic, I'm not buying it. So that gets to our next one, which I had my supervisor at work had even mentioned a couple weeks ago. He said, oh, I watched this thing on uh, this guy that invented a, a turbine car and it got unbelievable mileage and it never broke down and then someone killed him off and i was like oh that sounds a lot like the water car so i started looking into turbine engines now in the past i, th I believe i've said turbine not turbine it's turbine turbine is something someone would wear on their head but there is a very good documentary about the chrysler turbine there was actually a model of car that they made but very narrow production called the turbine it was a chrysler turbine and Haggerty actually made it and they made the documentary there's actually quite a few documentaries on it and this was actually a production vehicle not production in the sense that you could buy one but they produced 55 of these vehicles and there's still nine of them left uh, jay leno actually owns one and this was a chrysler car with a a jet engine basically but instead of being jet engine in the way you would just push a plane through the air it had a transmission it turned the tires so <clears throat> technically it was a turbine engine because it wasn't using jet force to push it but it was a very interesting vehicle these were like i said there was never something you could buy but chrysler was experimenting with them and they're pretty interesting if you haven't seen it it's an over an hour documentary on the Haggerty channel but i watched the whole thing i found it as a fan of the muscle car era older cars in general, alternative fuels. It was super interesting. Now, was it a, would it have been a production success? No, it wasn't. Fuel economy wise, it wasn't really any better than an internal combustion engine. There's a lot of problems with a turbine engine opposed to a piston engine. There's a lot of lag for acceleration because obviously it's basically like a big turbocharger. You have to wait for it to spool up very very loud emissions controls not really any uh the turbine itself is very simple as far as moving parts there aren't that many basically one main moving part but it runs such high rpm up to 60,000 rpm that you can't directly run a transmission with it so they basically had to have a step down uh, 10 to 1 ratio where it would take the turbine speed uh down from 10 to 1 ratio into a normal torque flight transmission. The cars are very cool looking. Uh, like I said, already the biggest problems were the fuel economy wasn't that amazing. Uh, they were, they could be very loud. They were very, very, very expensive. Uh, current dollars adjusted for inflation, they would have been a, over $500,000 each car. $500,000. But the idea is pretty interesting because they could run on a variety of fuels. It wasn't a diesel or a kerosene, jet fuel, any of those. It wasn't particular. It wouldn't run on leaded gasoline, but it said it would run on unleaded gasoline. Uh, people ran it on uh, cognac, tequila, but generally they would run it on kerosene, jet fuel, diesel, unleaded gasoline. So very cool. If you haven't seen it or heard of it before, I really think it's interesting. And you don't really see a lot of turbine powered vehicles anymore, but the Abrams tank, uh, the US military main battle tank is a turbine powered vehicle. Pretty interesting. Now the next two or few subjects I should talk about aren't necessarily one guy inventing something that really is gonna blow the lid off of the whole petroleum industry, but it's just ideas. Some of them are ones that I've thought about that would or could possibly increase fuel economy and it's, why don't they do them? Well, we're going to discuss that right now. But before that, how about a little destruction of the week?
This week's destruction of the week comes from Jerry, and Jerry sent me a picture of this little skid steer, and he loves this thing like a child. And he sent me some pictures initially saying, hey Josh, I did an oil change on this thing, and after that, something happened overhead. It started banging and clanging, and we got bent bolts and bent push rods. What could it be? And I said, well, when you have that much damage in an overhead, I said, probably something changed between the cam and crank timing, and unfortunately, I was correct. So apparently he had used some blocks to block up this thing, and for some reason they had pushed into the oil pan, which scraped the gears and crushed that into the gears, which of course damaged the cam gear, damaged the crank gear, the oil pump gear, which caused the timing to be off in the engine, which caused damage to the overhead, and unfortunately for Jerry, did a whole bunch of damage to this machine, which he likes very much, so sorry about that, Jerry. Uh, Bad stuff happens all the time. Sorry to hear it happen to you, sir. Why don't you guys give him some uh, words of encouragement there? He's always been a good subscriber and sender of Destruction of the Week videos. So the first one is one that, when I was living at home, even my dad would mention, was Brown's Gas. I believe it's also called Oxyhydrogen or HHO. It's not pure hydrogen. It's a flammable compound that you can make fairly simply from breaking down water. And it, like I said, it's a somewhat, it's a flammable substance, but people think that you can plumb it into your intake and it will increase fuel economy. Cause what you're doing is you're breaking down water and you're making this Brown's gas is what we'll call it. And it's, since it's flammable, can increase fuel economy. There's actually quite a few videos and homemade kits and even kits online that claim this and probably one of the better demonstrations I saw was Project Farm did a video on it. He had bought this $200 HHO generator. He had ran a Suburban with it and he did some generator tests with it. And now maybe it's the one he bought didn't work right folks, but turns out it didn't work at all. It actually decreased the fuel economy of the generator. Not a ton, but it made it run less long on the same amount of fuel. It actually takes some power to make this product, this Brown's gas, kind of like the hydrogen generator on the water car. So the idea that it would make fuel and make your car run more fuel economy, to me, doesn't make any sense. Now, there's a lot of videos online of people claiming that they have an HHO generator or some sort of generator that just uses the voltage that's already on your car, which is generally 12 volts, to produce something that goes in an intake that can increase fuel economy. Now, I'm not calling them all liars. Maybe there are ones out there that do that. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. And if you think you can make a little pickle jar with two electrodes that just use the alternator voltage to make this gas that is then gonna go into your intake and increase fuel economy, am I gonna try it? No, I don't think it's gonna work, folks. I think what you're doing there is you're trying to make a perpetual motion machine and it's unlikely to work. Now, folks, the next set of ideas are ones that aren't something that are gonna power a vehicle. They would be more of an efficiency sake. And I was, I, these are things that I think about sometimes, and if you think about them long enough, you kind of solve your own problems before ever having to do an experiment. And two ideas that had come to mind were, when I was doing the diesel engine uh, video series, it talked a lot about steam and how uh, steam piston engines and steam turbines after that had powered pretty much the entire world up until gasoline, diesel, jet engines. So I was wondering, since heat engines being diesel, gasoline, jet engines aren't 100% efficient, they're, if they're lucky, 50% efficient, they waste a lot in heat energy. Think about your exhaust, a lot of heat going out of there. That's energy wasted or the cooling system. You're literally collecting heat from the engine and then just dispersing it into the atmosphere. Why isn't there a way to recapture that? And it turns out there is in certain applications, especially like power production plants, stationary engines, very large engines, they will try to recapture this heat, sometimes heating incoming fuel or using some sort of steam turbine itself to recapture some of that energy. But I was wondering, two things, why can't they use the cooling system, which is close to boiling temperature, to power some sort of steam turbine or something that would power the drive shaft or the transmission that would then move the vehicle. 
There's a lot of energy wasted, as we already said in there, and I kind of answered a lot of my own questions by thinking of that. Close to boiling point. Well, you never, here's the problem with that. In order to produce steam, obviously, you have to get it to that, that boiling point, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius. But the problem is you don't want your cooling system boiling. Boiling makes your cooling system not work very well. And your cooling system is not there to trap the heat and use it for something else. It's there to get rid of the heat to protect the engine itself. So if you then start trying to get it closer to the boiling point or get it to a boiling point, you risk damaging the engine almost certainly. And that creates a lot of problems because then you're trying to do the opposite of what that cooling system was designed for. So that kind of shot that idea out of the park. So I was thinking, what if they ran a heat exchanger where you would run your cooling system normally, let's say at 220 degrees, but under pressure so it's not boiling and coolant will increase the boiling point also. And then you ran it into distilled water and then the distilled water system would get to the boiling point and then that would run a steam turbine or something. Yes, you could do that. However, since you're only getting to about 220 degrees, generally you want it to be a lot harder to get that water to boil on the secondary circuit, the steam side. Not only that, are you gonna then have a water tank and a boiler? And I mean, how much necessary items would you have to add to that? Are people gonna maintain this extra system? You might be adding a couple hundred pounds and then you have to constantly add water to the system to gain 10% more fuel efficiency, you'd probably lose that in the extra weight of the vehicle. So it didn't really work that well. So what about the exhaust system? The exhaust, very, very hot, right? It's way past boiling point. Why don't they use that heat energy to push a turbine or something? Well, sometimes they do. It's called a turbocharger. Now the turbocharger itself is not powering the engine directly. It's forcing air back into the engine, which can make it more efficient. However, just the turbocharger by itself adds complexity to the engine, right? You're gonna be running higher intake pressures because you're gonna be running a boosted engine. The turbocharger itself is expensive. You then have to run oil to the turbocharger. It just makes it more of a complicated machine, but worth it if you can make it work. Well, what about after the turbocharger? Why not capture that energy? Well, a lot of that has to deal with emissions controls if you think about it. A lot of emissions controls need that heat energy, whether it's a catalytic converter, DPF, something like that, they need heat energy in order for them to work. So if you were trying to extract this heat energy out to same thing, heat a boiler or something to run a steep turbine, you're kind of back to the same thing with the cooling system. You're adding all this weight and complexity that isn't actually gonna really benefit you that much unless it's maybe a stationary unit or something. Not only that, exhaust gases are not clean they're usually carbon saturated, so it's really gonna plug up a lot of stuff that you're trying to not plug up, hence the emissions controls. So, kind of touching on those subjects there, I mean, we really discussed five here, the water car, the turbine car, the Brown's gas additive, if you wanna call it that, and then the two different stir, uh, turbine, uh, or steam turbine designs that could possibly help efficiency, folks. Just different things that I've thought about, different things that have come up over the years, did some research on, thought it was pretty interesting. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.